I don't think policymakers can afford to let asset markets collapse in the way that they've collapsed before. For the simple reason that this is the main source of demand. This is a feature of markets we're gonna see more and more episodes like, like December of 2018. Very sudden shocks, people panic, you get large sell-offs in Wall Street, and then calming words from central bankers, maybe they rebound again. If you look at the reaction of financial markets to economic events, they're on a hair trigger. They only need a little bit of uh, bad economic news and markets plunge, a little bit of good economic news, they power up again. And I've never seen sensitivity of that degree. I'm Mike Howell, I'm uh, CEO of Cross Border Capital, based here in London. Uh, my background has been in research. I've been in financial markets uh, probably 30 years, originally at Salomon Brothers, uh, and then head of research at Bearings. If you look at the financial system, effectively the financial system relates to an economy that is now not raising new capital. It's effectively uh, refinancing its existing capital. And that goes back to the change in the world economy that we saw around the fall of the Berlin Wall. Emerging markets came in, it made it very unprofitable for Western industry to set up new plant. Consequently, they didn't, they just went into for, for cost restructuring. And effectively what they're doing is they're just raising their cash flows. And what you're seeing in Western financial markets now is effectively a big role. They're taking on debt, they're refinancing. If you're refinancing, it's not the interest rate that really matters, it's the capacity, it's the ability to roll your positions over. And balance sheet is all important. That is what, what uh, our measures of liquidity are all about. They're measuring balance sheet size. On the debt question, it's, it's what you really need if you've got debt is to be able to roll that position over. You either pay it back or you refinance it. And the refinancing is really a critical question. Now, we're not saying that interest rates are completely unimportant, they're not, but it's the ability to do that role that's important, and what you need is balance sheet capacity. Now, there are a whole lot of changes in the financial system which make it complicated, which I'll come on to, but basically, if you've got a balance sheet which is the wrong size or in inappropriately structured, you basically get mismatches, and mismatches are really what drive financial markets. That's where you get risk premium emerging, and fundamentally, there are three basic uh, if you like, uh, fault lines that expose risk premium that we tend to look at. One is effectively a, a maturity mismatch. So in other words, that uh, the, the financial system has got is, is too short or too long, long-dated debt. The second question is credit risk, the whole question about the quality of what you're holding. Uh, is it poor quality? Is it good quality debt? And the third one is foreign exchange risk. Now, where they come through is in really three particular spreads. One is the maturity spread, the term spread if you like, the slope of the yield curve, call it that. Uh, the second one is the credit spread, uh, in other words, the, the quality spread, what's the spread between junk debt and treasury. And the third one is the FX swap spread. These are the factors that really matter. And if you see these spreads beginning to blow out, then you've got mismatch problems. And the financial system is creaking because balance sheets are inadequate in terms of the size and there are mismatches being exposed. And that's what December was all about. And effectively, if you go back a decade, that's what 2007, 2008 was all about. Let's go back to the structure of the global financial system. What's happened in the last 20 years is it's become far less bank-based far less nationally based, it's now much more global, it's based around wholesale funding markets where collateral is really the critical question. In other words, to extend credit you need collateral. And the whole financial system rests on this base of collateral. Now, what we've got to think about is how structure has changed. And the structure has principally changed in two ways. One is that central banks have effectively been forced to become a lot more active. They used to sit much more on the sidelines 20, 30 years ago. They now have to be at the forefront of these flows. 
within the money markets. The second issue is the growth of corporate and institutional cash pools. Now, this is a sort of complicated and slightly wonkish concept, but let's, let me try and go through it. What you've had in the last 20 years is the growth of corporations who have got these cash piles. They're not investing in new plant and equipment. What they're doing is they're basically holding it in treasury. You've got big technology companies in the US who are throwing off cash. They don't need CapEx. What do they do with it? They're holding it in their treasury departments. So that's, that's one source. And that's probably in, in America right now, a pool of about two to three trillion dollars. Wasn't there before. Second thing is the growth of things like sovereign wealth funds. Uh, they've suddenly come on the scene. What's their balance sheet? $5 trillion at least, that sort of magnitude. You've got things like the, the, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, a trillion. Uh, you've got CIC in China, about another trillion, etc. These are big, big numbers. Then you've got the growth of foreign exchange reserves. This has really been a phenomenon that's come in uh, principally since the Asian crisis right back in 97, 98. You saw a big growth in foreign exchange reserve holdings. They've jumped globally by about $10 trillion and they've jumped uh, in emerging markets by about seven. Now that needs to be managed. They need safe assets to put these foreign exchange reserves in. Now on top of that, you've got uh, wealth managers who have seen large inflows of money because of, of demographic change. They need to manage that cash. And then on top of that, you've got, you've got derivative futures uh, exchanges which need cash collateral. So there's tremendous structural demands for cash within the system. And this is really coming through the wholesale money markets. Now, the question is, they need uh, safe assets, they need safe liquid assets. How do you create them? Well, the opportunities in the system are basically treasury bills or, or bank deposit accounts, okay? That's where we've traditionally been. Austerity policies by governments mean there's not very much government debt around. The banks have been uh, essentially uh, just outweighed or outgrown by these corporate and institutional cash pools. In other words, if you're a big corporation and you're sitting on $20 million, are you prepared to put it into a bank? You'd be crazy to do that because the banks are vulnerable. Uh, they've only got deposit guarantees in America of $250,000, uh, you know, way smaller than your 20 million. Uh, in Europe, it's about 100,000 euros. So effectively, what you've got to do is to find a secure asset. So what happens is the money markets effectively repo debt. They can repo government debt, uh, they can repo private debt, but what they're effectively doing is creating a short-term instrument which has got this, ca this cash collateral. And that's what these big institutional cash pools are really feeding right now. Now the problem basically comes is if you run out of things to collateralize, and that's the problem. So if you've got central banks that are doing QE, that are sucking up the treasury debt, and you've got treasurers themselves who are just not issuing debt, where does the collateral come from? It basically has to come from the private sector. So what you're seeing in the US right now is tremendous issuance in the, in the, in the uh, triple B market, just about investment grade. That's been, uh, that's been skyrocketing in issuance terms, but that's because there's big, big demand for quality private sector debt to collateralize for this repo market. And what you're seeing in the US, and bear in mind that, let's take a global perspective here, it's really only Wall Street that's having a bull market. And the question that your, your viewers need to ask is, why is this uh, bull market only really in the US, principally? The reason being is that a lot of this cash that corporations in America are getting because of the ability to issue corporate debt is being funneled back into Wall Street through share buybacks. So what you've got is essentially a, a pyramid which looks kind of quite shaky. And the problem comes is if you get a breakdown in these wholesale markets. Now, we've seen that once before. We saw it in 2007, 8. It wasn't corporate debt the problem then, it was mortgage-backed securities. They were flaky. If there's a problem in terms of corporate quality right now, the system is gonna implode like it did in 2007, 8. And the central banks need to be really wary about this. Now, if you go back to December, 2018, this was a warning sign. We think we got very close to a 2007, 8 episode again. All the signs were there. What you saw was the, the, the US dollar spiking. Uh, you saw tremendous demand for, for, for government uh, bonds, treasury bonds. Credit spreads widened out, repo rates went up, Wall Street tanked. And then the Federal Reserve came in, made an announcement in January, calmed everybody down because it said it was gonna rethink policy. Now that's really a, a very, very important statement. 
We don't know how the Federal Reserve is, is going to end its thinking. It's still thinking about how it does it. But the outcome is critical for not just US financial markets, but for world financial markets. What you've got is a system that's creaking. The question is, what are the shocks that it can take? Now, if you look at the world economy, you look at it in context, the shocks that we used to see in the 1960s and 70s were oil shocks or, or labor cost shocks. The shocks we're seeing now are shocks to the, the whole global liquidity structure, the complex. And those are the things that are unpredictable, and this is what central banks need to guard against. So the whole idea of doing QT, of sucking out this precious liquidity, is extremely dangerous. And what they need to do is basically make sure the system has got enough liquidity to operate. And the question is, number one, has the Federal Reserve changed? Now, we th originally thought in January the sort of statements they were making convinced us they probably had. They saw these threats, okay, uh, and the statements that Powell made were, were very incisive, I think. If you look at what's happened since then, and you look at uh, operations within the money markets, what the Fed's doing, they are continuing to suck liquidity out. There was a little bit of a blip in uh, late January, February, uh, it's now come down again. Because basically there are some structural impediments in the system, which mean there is this shortage of liquidity because of a general lack of, of collateral. But then what you've seen in the last, let's say, three to four months, is a tremendous inflow into markets that's largely come from cross-border investors. Okay? Now, this is very similar to what we saw in early 2016, uh, the so-called Shanghai Accord. A lot of money came into markets, investors went risk on, markets rose for uh, what probably a period of two years, I think, almost uninterrupted, uh, and that was a good time to be risk on. We think this could happen again. You could see you know, enough momentum coming through in this cross-border flows to actually push markets further up. Therefore, our instinct is to say, looking at these indicators, we, kind of, we, we want to be risk on in this environment. But at the back of our mind, we've got this problem that you've got this potential crevasse in markets, like December, when you get a problem. And when you get a problem, markets panic. And you're going to see, we think, an environment where markets broadly drift upwards, but with very sharp spikes down. Now, the critical question is, how do you asset allocate in that environment? And the one thing that you need in portfolios, if you are maintaining risk on, is number one, to diversify out away from the US market, where well, particularly the FANG stocks, where most of the big uh, increases have been seen, out into markets like Japan, like China, like probably Britain, uh, which look, we think, undervalued in this context relative to Wall Street. And you need to have bonds in your portfolio, but particularly what you need is bond convexity. And bond convexity, which is a wonkish concept, I know, is basically being able to participate in very big outsized moves in the bond market. Now, are you going to get these outside moves? It's entirely possible. Okay, let's not rule this out. And what I, what I would say is what your viewers need to ask is, why have you got three critical prices which are kind of out of whack? The first thing is you've got a negative term premium on the treasury market, okay? This is beyond unusual. It's, ve it's, it's just very, very rare, okay? You don't see this very often. And term premium are normally positive, they're negative. And what that's saying is that basically people are prepared to own long-dated treasuries at a discount. Uh, there's a big demand, excess demand for treasuries. The second thing is, why are US rates 250 basis points above other big markets. I mean, this is really strange. The US dollar is the safest asset in the world. The US treasury market is the safest piece of collateral. And yet you've got yield premiums against everybody else. It makes no sense, okay? Something is, is being mispriced in the system. And the third thing is, as I mentioned earlier, Wall Street's really the only equity place where you've got a decent bull market. Everyone else is kind of flatlined pretty much uh, over the last 18 months or so, or even gone down. Prudence would say you need to rotate into markets that have been left behind. Uh, there's a lot of value out there, and what you're seeing, I think, is you know more and more evidence that outside of the U.S. the world economy is stabilizing. So that would suggest that investors are going to start to move more risk on. Now, one of the critical places to watch is China. Now, it's very interesting to see the move that you've seen in the Chinese market. Uh, so far this year, we have had a view that China looks radically undervalued given the, the longer term prospects. 
The curiosity is the market has basically convinced itself that the PBOC, China's People's Bank, is basically easing policy. They, so the commentary says, they've injected huge amounts of money into the money markets. Simply is not true. Okay, There was a jump in credit in January, but that's a seasonal effect. That's a seasonal effect that always occurs in China in January because of the, of the Lunar New Year holiday. Once you take that out, essentially liquidity has gone down. And if you look at the daily operations of the People's Bank right up to yesterday, what you see is that they've been progressively taking liquidity out. Now, why is that happening? It's, you know, it's a head-scratching moment, we're not sure. But I would argue it's all to do with the China-US trade talks. And the one thing that China cannot afford to let happen is the yuan, the, the, the Chinese currency, to devalue. Because once it starts to devalue, it can cascade. There can be a lot of money moving offshore. Now, although you've got capital controls, the capital account is leaky, and that's a problem. So our view is that one of the things they've been doing is effectively maintaining a tight grip on the markets to try and make sure that the yuan is stable. And to do that, they've basically kept money markets on quite a tight leash. Now, once these trade talks are over, we would fully expect that you're going to see a lot more liquidity being thrown at the Chinese markets. What they'll have to do is effectively restructure the economy away from exports, much more towards infrastructure and domestic growth. And if you look at the pattern that is being followed, our contention is this looks like the US attack on Japan in the 1980s. It looks very, very similar, ending with Super 301. And that's what effectively is going to happen in the case of, the, of uh, China-US trade talks. China will have to open up. The US will score a victory, and China will have to move more into domestic focused growth, which means infrastructure. To pay for that, the People's Bank comes into play. A lot of the money that's coming to markets has not come from the Federal Reserve, as people would suggest, or from the People's Bank of China. It's effectively come from cross-border investors. This has been the big increase. And what you've seen in terms of the data that we collect is that the amounts of money which are flowing cross-border into risk assets are basically have doubled since late last year. I mean, these are, these are big numbers. And that is what is powering the rise in equity markets and risk assets. We saw it once before in late 2015, early 2016, and it was very meaningful then. It's very difficult for us to say, well, okay, this is going to end tomorrow, it's going to end in a month's time, because in those cases, it went on for, for several months or quarters. So what we're saying is we've got to be cognizant of that. Investors want returns, after all. This is, this is the issue. Uh, and so we're reluctant to say, sell now. That would be the wrong statement. We don't see uh, you know, sufficient cause for that. But what we're saying is there are, there are problems out there big problems, structural problems, that can cause a rerun of a December 2018, or worse, a 2007-2008. Now, I come back to the statement that if you look at the bond markets, you could see in the US yields dropping to match yields currently in Japan or in the, on the German Bund, i.e. zero. That would be a tremendous gain for US bond investors. The question is, two things to think about. One is that, um, the, the chairman of the St. Louis Federal Reserve, James Bullard, wrote a really incisive piece 10 years ago, 2010, called The Seven Faces of the Peril. What that basically says is that there is a risk with the policy that the Federal Reserve is adopting that we're structurally locked in to a trend towards zero interest rates. Okay? That looks like it's panning out. Okay? Uh, there doesn't seem to be very much inflation. The guys at BlackRock, Rick, Rick Reader's group, have done tremendous work from what we see on, on proving that inflation is not an issue. So the Federal Reserve is running too tight a monetary stance on this basis. Now, the other twist in the system is a duration mismatch. And let's go back to this idea that balance sheets are out of line and you've got mismatches. The biggest mismatch in terms of world investment is a duration mismatch in terms of of pension liabilities and pension assets. And let me try and explain it this way. What you've got is pension liabilities with a duration, in other words, an average payout 20 years hence. And what you've got is a lot of pension funds globally who are holding duration of about 10 years in their portfolios. In other words, they're holding, let's say conceptually, 10-year treasuries. Therefore, they have a 10-year mismatch. Now, the problem with duration on the bond markets, which again is a fairly wonkish thought, but let me try and explain it, is that if interest rates go down, your 20-year liability shoots up faster than your 10-year asset. And so the asset liability gap 
starts to widen. And that puts a lot of pressure on planned sponsors, particularly in aging populations or aging workforces. And this really crystallizes their attention. And what they say to their fund managers is, you've got to close that duration gap. You need to buy treasuries right now. So the problem is you've got an accelerator or amplification system in, the, uh, in markets. If treasury yields start to drop, they accelerate. And what you could see is a cascade down quite quickly to 0% yields. Now that's entirely possible. So shocks are really dangerous. And that's why we're saying the Federal Reserve has got to be very alert to this. And the whole idea of a QT policy is hugely dangerous. Therefore, how do you protect against this? What you've got to do is to run a portfolio which probably is broadly risk on, but you've got to have this protection with bond convexity. And that would say, if, you, if you've got bond convexity, large, you're going to make a lot of money out of large drops in Treasury yields. This is the knife edge the Fed is operating. I wouldn't like to be Powell at the moment. It's a really difficult position to be in. You know, yields go either way, but the problem is, is that the system is vulnerable to shocks. And if you start to shake the tree, a lot of things happen, a lot of things fall off. And what we're saying is, if you get this shock to the system, the shock to the system could mean you get this cascade, a sort of a disequilibrium move, where you push yields down to zero. Many people say, well, of course it can't happen. But hey, what about Japan? What about Germany? You've got yields there which are already zero. People said that couldn't happen, but it is. And the pressure that's putting on financing pensions uh, and insurance companies in these countries is a real, real threat. The Fed is hugely important because of the, of the role of the, of, the, of the US currency. I mean, that, that clearly is critical. And that matters not just for the US, but for the whole world, emerging markets particularly. But then China is also increasingly important because China drives the world economy in terms of growth terms, particularly when one looks at Asia or more, more closely at home, look at Germany. Germany has been very adversely affected by the slowdown in China. Uh, we can see that. So I think that, you know, it's both. It has to be both. Uh, what, you know, the Federal Reserve doesn't drive the US economy in the same way that the People's Bank drives the Chinese economy. Uh, but nonetheless, both are very important. This is a feature of markets. We're going to see more and more episodes like, like December of 2018. Very sudden shocks. People panic. You get large sell-offs in Wall Street. Uh, and then calming words from central bankers. Maybe they rebound again. And that's the sort of issue. I don't think policymakers can afford to let asset markets collapse in the way that they've collapsed before permanently. For the simple reason that this is the main source of demand. Wealth effects are important in the world economy in an environment where you've got no capital expenditure, where you've got aging populations, where you know, uh, export growth is, is limited. You can see in many ways, if you look at the reaction of financial markets to economic events, they're on a hair trigger. You don't need a little bit of uh, bad economic news and markets plunge, a little bit of good economic news, they power up again. And I've never seen sensitivity of that, of that degree. But you're probably right that if, to get the, econo the economy moving, you need bigger and bigger dollops of liquidity. And that is really a feature that we've seen as a result of aging populations, more and more competition from emerging markets. It's after what Japan has been seeing for the last 30 years. Well, it comes back to the whole nature of the financial system resting on this, on this collateral base. So if you get collateral being undermined, and you know, let's say you get an earthquake in the US corporate sector where corporate debt deteriorates in quality significantly, then there's a big, big problem. And then governments are going to have to come in big, big time, big size. Uh, there's got to be a lot more safe assets put in the system, more treasury issuance. You know, clearly, uh, the Trump infrastructure program in the next two years is going to help that. but. Uh, we're talking about bigger, bigger size, and the Federal Reserve is going to have to come in and re-engage a serious QE policy. And the problem is that what we're really saying is the structural changes in the world economy mean that central banks have got to have a front seat here, not a back seat. The primary issue in the world economy is a change in, in structure. The, the polarity of the financial system has effectively reversed. What, who were lenders and now borrowers, and who were borrowers and now lenders. The whole system has changed. That makes it very, very complex to understand. But effectively, what the system is now is based around the wholesale money markets. And what those need is good quality collateral. And the question is, you don't have it. The Federal Reserve has been taking collateral out of the system, and governments 
are not issuing treasuries anymore. Austerity policies are, are basically rooting the roost. So what there is is a big pushback onto private sector collateral. And we know that is a flaky quality. If that deteriorates, the collateral base shrinks, liquidity plunges and markets drop. That's the big risk. Central banks need to be in the front seat. How do we gauge the central banks, which are the most important? There are two big ones out there. They're both of similar size. If anything, the People's Bank in China is slightly bigger than the Federal Reserve, the other one, but both are very important. China's People's Bank effectively controls the tempo of the Asian economies and emerging markets, and the US is basically there for the developed world. They're both very important to watch. Uh, errors by either of them can cause serious problems. How are we going to be positioned in this environment? Well, look, risk exposure is nothing like as extended as it was in 2018. People have become a lot more cautious. That suggests to us that we can afford to be risk on to some extent. And what you're seeing in markets is a lot of cross-border money coming back in rather like 2016. That clearly we think is an opportunity to be in risk assets. But we're cognizant of the fact that we're going to get more Decembers more December of 2018s. There'll be crevasses, and you want to avoid those. So you've basically got to position your portfolio. Number one, diversified, okay? We think looking non-US is critical because for the last two years, you've only really had a Wall Street bull market and maybe even a fang bull market within Wall Street. So let's look outside. Let's look at Japan. Let's look at China. Let's look at the UK, which looks very undervalued because of all this Brexit nonsense, but it's a very cheap market. Uh, and possibly even start to look at Germany. These are some opportunities. On top of that, you need bond defense. And you need treasuries in your portfolio, US treasuries, but what you want is exposure to big outsized moves. What that means, wonkish concept called convexity. That's what you basically got to embed in the portfolio. Convexity, which means exposure to outside bond moves. Effectively, the whole issue that the world is really facing is a problem of liquidity and a problem of duration. These are the two concepts that when I started at Salon Brothers were paramount. Uh, these were things, liquidity, the doyen was uh, Henry Kaufman, who did the original work on flow of funds, and Marty Leibowitz basically was Mr. Duration. These are the concepts that are coming back now. They're the critical things for investors to understand. The bond markets are important. The most important price in the world uh, is the price of the, of the dominant economy's debt, and that's the U.S. Treasury.